men. And I saw in that reading it's 77 times and there's another one that says 70 times seven. Be that as it may, that's still a lot because when I was a seventh grader, back in the days when we had to walk to school uphill one way, actually it was uphill both ways, barefoot in the snow, so <laughs> it was so long ago. Well, when I was in the seventh grader, I returned home from school one day earlier than expected, actually to the surprise of my mother. And I, I had a note in my hand from the principal. Uh, and it wasn't extolling my virtues as a stellar student. I, I can tell you that, too. Um, but rather an explanation as to why I had been uh, dismissed early. Isn't that much of a nicer way to say it than I was suspended? Yeah, it just rolls off the tongue better. Yeah. You see, I'd been fighting with another student in the gym class. Best class ever to have a fight if you're going to have one. One playground. But anyway, that was the reason I was sent home. I had been fighting with another student, and, and as my mother read the note, I was looking at her face, and I knew I was in some serious hot water. But I took just a little bit of comfort in knowing that that was just a tempest in a teapot until my father got home and read that note. Then I might as well have packed my bags and go. And she said, and she often took, I don't want to say often because that sounds like I was a bad boy, but she, she took time more than once to, to make that a teaching moment. You know, we use that expression, teaching moments now in our vernacular. She was using it back when it wasn't used so often. And she used that as a moment to remind me, she said, don't you remember the story? She, first she wanted to know, who was it? And I told her, it was a neighborhood friend. And she said, don't you remember what Jesus said about it? I said, I know, Mom. I said, I remember. He was teasing me for weeks, and I'd finally had enough. And then she was a little patient. She said, remember Jesus telling Peter about how many times you should be forgiven? And so... I thought about that for a moment, and I said, in a glib way, I think, I said, sure, I remember that story, Mom. I said, um, that was 490 times. I said, but today was the 491st time that he teased me, so I punched him in the nose. <laughs> well, it was with a heavy heart and a soapy mouth that I retired to my room for the evening. She was not happy with my answer. But I ask you this morning, what is the measure of your forgiveness? What is the measure of your forgiveness? How often should we forgive? Is there a limit to one's forgiveness? That's the question that Peter was really asking. How many times, Lord, should we do this? You see, forgiveness is one of the most profound and life-altering aspects of our Christian faith. Think about that. It's a concept that runs to the very heart of Christianity. Forgive our enemies. Do good to those who hurt us. Repay e evil with kindness. What kind of nonsense is that? I'm an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth man myself. But yet forgiveness may make the difference between war and peace with neighbors, with nations. It can make the difference between hatred and love with relationships. And it can make the difference between hope and despair when all is lost. Without forgiveness, hurt and anger grow unchecked, don't they? They grow unchecked and we recycle that resentment and that failure and that bitterness and, and the mistrust and it becomes a millstone around our necks. It's heavy. Martin Luther King once said, 
that forgiveness is the catalyst for creating an atmosphere of a fresh start and a new beginning. You see, it reflects the mercy and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. To understand then the concept of forgiveness, we turn to our scriptures, which is our ultimate divine resource for guidance and understanding. And there are numerous verses that speak to forgiveness, but none more powerful than the words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And he said in those words this, forgive us our debts as we also have been forgiven our debts. I, I like to use the word trespass better than debts. And the reason I like to use a trespass literally means a violation of an established law. And what were the two laws that Jesus said everything else turns on? Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when we, we have enmity with our neighbors, we are trespassing the law of God. a wonderful book called The Hiding Place. Anybody read that book by Corey Ten Boom? It was one of the great must-readings some years ago. And she was a prisoner in a, a Nazi concentration camp, she and her sister. And she tells a story in that book about an encounter that she had with the former SS soldier who was the prison guard at the shower station in the prison camp. And the encounter happened with her after she had just given a lecture on, of all things, forgiveness. And she looked up and she saw this hated monster coming toward her with his hand out extended to give her thanks. And she writes this. My hand was paralyzed as I recalled the indignities of the camp and his part in it. And she prayed, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And she said, as she reached out her hand to shake his, she experienced this, this understanding that it is not our forgiveness any more than it is our goodness. Let the world turns, but on Christ's love and Christ's forgiveness. Give me your forgiveness that I might forgive others. You see, we love because God first loved us. And we're called to extend that grace to others that was extended to us. The grace that we have received from God. We don't take it and keep it and, and hold on to it. We share it. And when God tells us to love our enemies then, he gives along with that command the very love itself. It's a divine imperative. We as Christians aren't given the option whether or not to forgive. Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. But overcoming the challenges of forgiveness is not always easy, is it? Certainly isn't. For example, it took 25 years for Michelangelo before he could forgive a rival for deliberately marring and, and defacing a set of drawings that he had. And after 25 years, when he was finally able to bring himself to go and, and forgive this man, he discovered the man had died. He never did get that opportunity, but for 25 years, he carried that burden in his heart. You see, when we've been deeply hurt or wronged, forgiving seems almost impossible, doesn't it? Yet we're reminded then of Jesus' own act of forgiveness when he was hanging on the cross, being crucified. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
in the midst of all of that suffering, he forgave them. And if Jesus forgave those who crucified him, surely we too can find our ways to forgive those who have wronged us. You see, forgiveness, my friends, begins with a conscious act of the will. You have to decide. And we can never be credible mediators of forgiveness and peace to others until we ourselves have experienced the acceptance and the assurance of forgiveness from our Lord. That's what John Wesley said when he was talking about that strange warming of the heart he had at Aldersgate. He knew in his heart that he had been forgiven. And he felt that liberation from that. You see, forgiveness is not just merely an act of pardoning one's wrongdoing. It's a transformative process in our lives. It mends broken relationships. It liberates the forgiven and the forgiver. And it heals both. Consider the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. He endured betrayal by his own brothers. They threw him in a pit. But we know the story. He became the second in command of the greatest power in the world. And when his brothers came to him for food, boy, he had the opportunity to crush them, didn't he? He could have put them all in prison. He could have had them all exiled. He could have had them all killed. Because he had the power. But he told his brothers this. He said, you intended harm to me, but God intended it for good. And in the end, instead of crushing his family, he was reconciled with them and the preservation of the family was assured. I think about families that have enmity with their own brothers or sisters or with their parents or with other parts of the family and they haven't talked to each other for years. And you go to a funeral and they're still sitting this side on one and that side on the other. It breaks my heart. Because when we choose to forgive, we, we release the burden of, of, of anger and the bitterness that can weigh heavily on our souls. Well, Pastor, how do we overcome the challenges to forgiving? First, prayer. Prayer. Pray for the grace to forgive. In turning to God in prayer, we then find the strength and the guidance that we need to extend forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Second, we need to reflect on our own need of forgiveness. Remembering that we too are recipients of God's grace and God's forgiving grace. Thirdly, let go of resentment. Let go of resentment. It's a stumbling block to reconciliation and forgiveness. And it only prolongs our suffering. And it's a, a vital first step to healing and forgiveness. And I think lastly, seek reconciliation wherever possible. Forgiveness does not always require reconciliation, excuse me, but it can be a powerful tool to rebuild relationships. And so as we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us be reminded ultimately forgiveness is the act of love. One who loved us so much that he went to the cross forgave us our sins. So walk 
in forgiveness, brothers. When we forgive, we imitate Christ's love and extend his grace to a broken world. And so we should walk in forgiveness all the time. It's not a one-time event. It's an ongoing, lifelong journey. It's paved with humility, with love and suffering and divine grace. And when we forgive, we demonstrate to the world the transforming power of God's love in our lives. So walk in forgiveness. Walk in forgiveness. Extending grace to others because you've received it. You might bring somebody to the Lord just because you forgave them. And in doing that, we bring restoration to the world around us and peace in our lives because we're set free. And so may the Holy Spirit guide you on this sacred journey of forgiveness in your life. Amen.